Welcome to the Good Friday service. I'm Drew, I'm the lead pastor at our Columbia Heights location and welcome to all of our locations from downtown, lower town and Columbia Heights. Also welcome if you're a friend or family member of someone from Hope or you're just checking Hope out, we're glad that you're here with us. We have an opportunity tonight to reflect on what Jesus did on the cross. We're gonna reflect on his death, the sacrifice he made so that we would not have to die and so that our sins would be paid for. We encourage you to gather a few things uh, before we enter into this time of reflection. Uh, We encourage you to gather some candles, if you have candles where you are at. Uh, Seven would be ideal, but even one would be great. Also, encourage you to gather some communion supplies. We're gonna be taking communion at the end of our service together, some bread and some wine or juice, and also Bible. Um, You may want to reference the passages we'll be reading or even just read more of the Good Friday and the Passion uh, of Jesus to better understand and reflect on that time. So I encourage you now to find those uh, items, uh, gather them, uh, take a moment to maybe pray, uh, prepare your heart and your mind for our service and our time together, and even light your candles. We encourage you even after candles are lit as the service continues on to blow those candles out um, as we get closer to the end of Jesus' life in our reflections. So right now, take a moment to pause the video and gather those supplies, or if if you don't wanna gather those supplies, just continue watching. And we'll start with our first reflection in a moment. The first words of Jesus are from Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now let's slow down versus just quickly passing through. Think about how something like this could be said when Christ before you, everything by your blood is stained red. For a moment, put yourself in Christ's place. Think about how much that statement drips with grace, that literally, Christ, you're the one that created this race, that with your coming, you should have been met with a joyful embrace. But no. Where instead does joy find its breath? Joy is found and given life by putting someone to death. They happily divided up his clothes by casting lots, a horrific scene of not connecting the dots. Now, put yourself in the shoes of that crowd, fists in the air, saying, Crucify him! Out loud, mocking, save yourself, show off your glory. Because that's where we all belong in this story. Forgive them. A short and simple phrase, one that should be constantly be drawing us to praise. Now, if I can take this moment to be real and If this isn't you, maybe this is just an issue with John Neal. But for me, even simple forgiveness can take days. Trying not to let it fester and take root in new ways. Lord, forgive them is not quick off my lips. If I'm honest, it's not even in my initial first script. My heart is very, is often very proud and very hard. And it takes a while for the spirit to help it lower its guard. I don't respond like those in the book of Acts, saying, Brothers, what shall we do? Or the woman to be the first to rush off and on Christ pour expensive perfume. Now, sadly, here's a story that's true. Before even writing this, I wanted to strangle my kid blue. And how sad that that's my response as a father to a son. And here you have a son saying to his father, forgive them. I'll die for them. I'll get the job done. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The love that's displayed when we have no clue. And I guess that's why there's 
beauty in the contrast versus the weight of my sin just so quickly moving past. As the parable goes, if you think you've been forgiven little, you'll forgive little, and if you've been forgiven much, much you'll forgive, and I don't want my forgiveness to be so brittle. So on days like Good Friday, my prayer is, Lord, help me keep my sin in view. So ultimately, Lord, I can just be more like you. Forgive them. A phrase of eternal worth. No doubt, the most history-changing phrase on earth. The second words of Jesus are from Luke 23, 43. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. In Luke 23, Jesus has just been crucified, brutally hung on a cross to die, suffering excruciating pain. And the crowd mocks him and the soldiers continue to mock him, saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And on his right and his left are two criminals and, and they begin to come into the story. And the first criminal says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. And the second criminal is the, the first to reply. And he says, don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly if we were getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then you imagine him turning to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's a big ask, right? Not sure how much this guy understood the kingdom, but he's asking. He's asking genuinely to be remembered in the kingdom. And Jesus answers him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now imagine that. You're hanging on a cross. You're dying. It's a, it's a certain death. And you're looking towards somebody else who's also on a cross to be that savior in that moment. And he promises you, you will enter into paradise with him. And we see in Revelation just a glimpse of what that paradise looks like. In Revelation 21.3, it says, Look, God's dwelling place is among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. They will, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This is what Jesus is promising this man. Can you imagine the dire situation of how, of how it feels to be on a cross? I can't. The pain, the humiliation, the yearning to not be there and suddenly this man is promising you this place where there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain where all these things all the pains of today all the injustice all the all the excruciation all the frustration is gone and the new has come The third words of Jesus are from John 19, 26. Woman, here is your son. Woman, here is your son. Woman, here is your son. When I was heading into the ninth grade, I brutally broke my ankle uh, in a game of recreational basketball. Yeah, intramural basketball. And the pain was terrible, uh, but it was somehow amplified the moment that I saw my mom, like an hour later. Uh, I don't know, it was something about seeing her in the midst of that physical pain that brought me into this place of needing to just be cared for, uh, seen, and just mothered. And uh, I bring this up because we're going to look now at the third word from the cross. And Jesus is going to be interacting with his mom. Um, and in this interaction, we see a very clear picture of the heart of God. So this is in John 19, just three very short verses. 25 to 27, it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. 
Well, there's a well-known physiological response that takes place in our bodies when we encounter a terrifying situation or a life-threatening scenario, and that's called fight or flight. Uh, in, in this situation, uh, our adrenaline starts pumping and our body is literally saying, you need to get out of here or you need to protect yourself. And Jesus has been undergoing this fight or flight adrenaline response for the past few hours. Uh, it's the most um, appropriate place to just be self-absorbed in survival mode. And it's here that we see Jesus look out into the crowd and see his mother and begin to consider her needs above his own. Uh, rather than looking at all the things that he needs to, needs and uh, to protect himself and to get out of the situation, he instead considers his mom, who is a widow and who's about to lose her son, and he provides for her by directing her attention to one of his disciples and saying, he is going to care for you as if he was your own son. He's gonna provide shelter, resources, food, uh, et cetera even as I go out of the world. And it's a compelling story that even in, in Jesus' dying moment, when he should be considering himself and his own pain, he can't help but provide comfort and care and protection for a widow, for his own mom. And yet, this story has more to say than just that. It's not less than that, but there's a lot more in these words. Specifically, it's, it's telling us how our needs are met near the cross. John wants us to first see that, that it's, it's actually standing near the cross that Mary is seen by Jesus and gets her needs met. That's what verse 25 says. It says they're standing near the cross. But notice again the words that Jesus chooses to say to Mary. It says, woman, here is your son, or literally, woman, behold your son. And in one sense, he's, he's very literal in his meaning of this, of look at this disciple of yours, and he is going to now act as if he was your own son and care for you. But when we zoom out and see the big picture that the Bible has been telling now for thousands of years, these words bring us all the way back to the beginning when sin first enters the world. And God promises Eve, the first woman, that she will one day bear a son. There will be a son in her line that will be born of a woman who is going to redeem the world of the curse of sin and death. And this is taking place now at the cross. And Jesus is stamping this event with those words saying, Behold the son born of the, born of the woman who has come to fix the brokenness of the world. And he's inviting us to consider where are we standing today? Come and stand near the cross where Jesus meets the needs of needy people like us and fixes what's broken in the world and fixes what's broken within us and provides for and cares for us in his death. The fourth words of Jesus are from Mark 15, 34. My God, why have you forsaken me? My God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Jesus says those words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if you're new to Christianity or new to the Bible, or maybe, maybe don't actually believe in Jesus, perhaps you've still heard the verse, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That is God saying that to his people as words of comfort and promise. So it should stand in stark contrast when we read this, when we read of God's own son crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, why have you forsaken me? It is the abandonment, the father turning his face away. And we have to ask the question, why? How do we understand these things? This is not the only clue that our passage gives us. It also says that darkness fell across the land between noon and 3 p.m. For three hours, darkness covered the land. What do we make of that? Well, there's three other times where we see darkness prominently displayed in Scripture. One is when discussing the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord was this coming day, this kind of unknown day, but we get these descriptions. It's, it's described as a time of judgment. 
It's said of the day of the Lord, this day of judgment, that it will be darkness and not light. So it's not necessarily a day to be looked forward to in regard to God's coming judgment. Jesus also speaks of darkness when he tells stories and parables. He talks about those who will believe in him and those who do not. Those who will trust him for salvation and those who will not. And this group who doesn't, their future experience will be one of darkness. An experience where, which involves weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can just like, kind of imagine this hellish, torturous experience being cast into darkness. The third time where we see the theme of darkness prominently displayed is in the Exodus. The ninth plague. You might not realize this, even for people that have read the Bible quite often. The ninth plague is one of darkness. Darkness covering the land for three days. And that darkness differentiates God's people from those who aren't God's people. That God's people actually, amidst this plague, experienced light. We're protected from the judgment of God. And it's interesting to note how that darkness from that plague is described. It's described as a darkness which can be felt. A darkness which can be felt. And that ninth plague of darkness comes right before the tenth plague, which is the death of the firstborn. And so we see that pattern played out here again in the account of Jesus hanging on the cross. That darkness comes before the death of God's firstborn or the death of Jesus. And so when we think about the God forsakenness that Jesus experiences, when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we have this experience along with it of, of darkness. We can be assured that Jesus is experiencing the judgment of God. The penalty of sin is coming to Jesus. He is bearing the wrath and the punishment. He is experiencing the darkness and the God forsakenness. He is cast out. He is experiencing what is torturous and hellish. He is experiencing a darkness that is real and is felt. And he does that on our account. He does that in order to save and preserve us. He does that so that we can see him as the light of the world. He is the one who experiences God forsakenness so that you and I can experience God's presence. The fifth words of Jesus are from John 19, 28. I am thirsty. I am thirsty. I am thirsty. The fifth saying that Jesus says from the cross that is recorded in John chapter 19, verse 28, that was just read, is simply, I thirst. I think we all probably know and have experienced in some way, shape, or form in our life what it is like to be thirsty. What it's like to thirst. What does it mean to, for Jesus to cry out, I, I thirst? Is there, is there more than just he's thirsty? And again, the verse says, after this, Jesus, knowing all that was about to be finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. So what is the scripture that is being fulfilled? Is the Messiah just supposed to be thirsty? What's this mean? And so the, the reference that Jesus here is quoting goes all the way back to Psalm 69, verse 21. And this is the Psalm. This is what it says here, the verse. They gave me poison for food and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Now, in our context of just verse 28, we don't fully understand what is the scripture being fulfilled. But if you read the next verse, 29, it says a jar of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. This isn't simply Jesus being thirsty. This isn't simply simply just someone suffering and crying out for a drip of water. This is to fulfill a prophecy that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to be mocked the entire time. He's going to be hanging on a tree and he's going to cry out in anguish, I'm thirsty, but people even in that moment are going to mock him. And they don't just give him sour wine. We could talk about the sour wine and and everything that happened with that. But I think what's more important is the method of how they delivered this wine. 
as you can see in this verse, verse 29, it says a jar of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge of it full of sour wine and gave it to him. Nothing is in the scriptures for, for nothing. Why is there a sponge next to the cross? Well, it just takes one quick Google search to realize that a part of a Roman soldier's, uh, their, their garb, their, their equipment that they would be given is a sponge and a stick. This was simply to clean themselves uh, after they've relieved themselves. And this sour wine, I mean, just, just picture this suffering and you have this mockery of the sour wine put on that sponge that a Roman soldier would have had, the mockery, the shame. But what happens though, in the moment when Jesus suffers that, it says, scriptures were fulfilled. These are prophecies and there's so many other prophecies that we could unpack about what happens in this moment of Jesus' death on the cross. But this is one, one that Jesus has mocked and scorned and ridiculed, even when he just cries out, I thirst. But he doesn't finish there. He's got a couple more things that he wants to say. The sixth words of Jesus are from Luke 23, 46. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last breath. What does it mean that Jesus committed his spirit? When I first read this, my brain wanted to make the jump that Jesus just finally gave in, that he let the Father win. But we know that's not true because Jesus willingly went to the cross for us on our behalf. So if that's not what commit means, how are we supposed to think about this verse? Something that is helpful uh, and can help us better understand the context of what Jesus is saying is taking a look back at the Old Testament. This phrase, into your hands I commit my spirit, is originally found in Psalm 31 verse five. David writes, into your hand I commit my spirit, you have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. So when Jesus said this, crying out in a loud voice, those who heard him say, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit, would call to mind Psalm 31 all of Psalm 31 and what David wrote. This Psalm is a Psalm of deliverance. David is sharing with God the pain and distress and anguish he is feeling after being abandoned by all his friends due to a powerful conspiracy that was happening at the time. David continues to say, you have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. So as Jesus is saying this from the cross, into your hands I commit my spirit, he is saying it with the same sentiment David did, yet in a fuller and truer sense. David was praying for deliverance from those who were against him. However, with Jesus quoting from the Old Testament, he is implying that this psalm is about me. It's going to reach its ultimate fulfillment through me. So just as David experienced abandonment from his close friends, Jesus also experienced abandonment from his disciples and his family. He was beaten, experienced anguish, pain, distress, and suffering based on a conspiracy that was against him and ultimately faced a wrongful death, even though he was willing to go to the cross for us. Jesus is saying, Father, I trust you with my death. I trust you in your deliverance. I trust in your redemption that you will redeem me for you are a faithful God and with you, I trust my life. The seventh and final words of Jesus are from John 19.30. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. 
in 1990, Carol and I bought our home here in South Minneapolis, which has been our home ever since. We have really enjoyed living in this 1915 old South Minneapolis house. Shortly after moving in, we realized that it needed a lot of upkeep as well as remodeling projects, and so we've been thinking about them over the years and doing several of them. One of the big ones was the kitchen. We knew when we bought the house we needed to redo the kitchen because it hadn't been done since the 1950s and was really in rough shape. But church things, raising children, uh, other projects on the house, all those things seemed to take precedent and we never seemed to get around to it. Until the end of 2018, we came up with a design and I started building the cabinetry in February of 2019. We demoed the old kitchen sink and the flooring and the cabinets uh, and all that uh, in July of 2019 and we had no kitchen for five weeks. We got it functional by August of 2019. Now, that's dangerous because once you get something functional, it is oftentimes then that you have a hard time going all the way and finishing things. But we slowly began working on that. And here's, let me show you the final product of what we have. Here you can see that we have put in a pantry and a new, a new stove. Um, it's a beautiful area over there. We kept our old dishwasher. It seems to work fine. As you move to the right here, you can see we put in a garden window. It's just an opportunity for us to really enjoy uh, the outdoors and what's going on in, in our backyard right there. As you keep going around, you can see now we added new cabinetry, under cabinet lighting, uh, new countertops, some of the things. And we tried to keep it so it looks like the old house that it is, and yet with all the modern conveniences. As you go around, and you, it's kind of a U kitchen, so to speak, but it has doorways. You can see we added a bunch of drawers, a new, another little countertop, and a place for the microwave. Probably one of the funnest areas was working into uh, workspace. We made out a butcher block and also figuring out where to put the, the uh, refrigerator. The last thing that was really difficult to figure out was what to do above the refrigerator because as you can see, that's where there is a slant or it's really a stairway going upstairs. You had to figure out how to do that. We came up with this design of how to make kind of a wine rack and a place for some pans or, or trays as well as a decorative area. And then the last the last nail went in. We got it done in time for Thanksgiving in 2020. It was kind of my pandemic thing to do all the trim and the, the small little projects around there. And then we were done, 100% done. And it felt awesome. There's something about taking a project all the way to completion and then looking at it and saying, I'm done. Jesus' last words on the cross, his last words, right after he went through everything, he said these three simple words, it is finished. The last nail in the project, in this case it was him, had been taken care of. He had lived a perfect life following all 613 commands of the Old Testament to the fullest and now he could die a perfect death and be the perfect sacrifice for us. His integrity was upheld so that his sacrifice on the cross was completely valid. So as we reflect this Good Friday and what Jesus Christ has accomplished, we do not need to add anything to it. There's no more appliances. There's no more trim. There's no more flooring. There's nothing to add because Jesus has said, it is finished. I've taken care of it all. Enjoy that this Good Friday. On that night before Jesus was crucified, he gathered with his disciples and he told them to do something to remember what was about to happen. And we still do that today at our church. We gather to take communion together. Jesus was with his disciples and he said, when you take bread, I want you to break it 
And I want you to remember that my body is going to be broken for you. And I want you to take wine and I want you to drink it. And I want you to remember that blood would be sh is going to be shed. Now they were sitting at a Passover meal, which was to celebrate when death passed over them because of the blood that was shed and the broken body of a lamb. And Jesus was telling them, I'm that lamb. My body is going to be broken. My blood is going to be shed. And get together and take this meal to remember that. And so tonight as we reflect on those last words that Jesus spoke, we're going to take communion because communion is an opportunity for us to reflect and remember Good Friday every time we take it. And so let's do that now. We're going to take, good, uh, we're going to take communion. I want to encourage you um, as we play some music to reflect, take communion, consider all that's been said uh, in our Good Friday service, and allow God to speak to you. Allow God to tell you, um, remind you of who you are and who he is. And maybe even there's something to take away from this experience tonight. So we're going to do that now. We're going to play music, and we encourage you at that time to take communion, reflect, maybe read scripture, reflect for a few moments, and then I'll uh, close us here in just a minute. To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away As wounds which bar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His death No gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know. wounds have paid my ransom thank you for joining us for our good friday service we hope you had an opportunity to reflect on the last words of jesus and reflect on this incredible sacrifice that was made for us we encourage you to continue reflecting on those for the next few days until Easter when we get to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. That today might be Good Friday, might be us reflecting on the death of Jesus, but in just a few days we get to remember and celebrate the risen Christ, a Jesus who death cannot hold. We encourage you to join us for those services. You can find out the services at all of our locations on our website. Uh, we'd love to celebrate with you that day.